I'm Julian Treasure. I'm chairman of a company called The Sound Agency, and uh, we help clients to answer the question, how does your brand sound? I'm also author of a book. The book's called Sound Business, and I have four talks on TED.com, all of them about sound and how it affects us. Well, I'll be talking about the four steps to good sound, and they start with acoustics. So you can put the best sound system and the most beautiful sound you like into a room with poor acoustics. It just won't work. So the first thing to get right is definitely acoustics. And architects could really enjoy playing with this. You know, it's possible to change the way space feels by changing acoustics from zone to zone. It's a new toy to play with. And I really hope they do start to get passionate and play with it. This building that we're sitting in has almost uniformly excellent acoustics I've experienced so far. Second step, uh, well, that's noise. And most buildings, particularly retail, but even in many, many, many educational facilities, don't get me started on hospitals. You think of the average hospital soundscape, it's beeps, buzzes, crashes, all threat sounds. That kind of noise needs to go because it's making the space not fit for purpose. So once you've got acoustics right and you have noise removed, then you need to put in a great sound system. And sadly, this is the thing that often gets value engineered out at the end of the process. We need to cut a bit off the budget. Let's cut the sound system. Nobody will notice. Well, they do, and it has a big effect. And then once you've got acoustics right, noise out, great sound system in, ideally with lots of zones, so it's future-proof and so forth, then and only then, content. And that's thinking about exactly what to deliver into the space. It might be silence, which is pretty much what we've got in the space we're in here. Or it might be a generative soundscape. That's a sound that we find very, very useful. It's algorithmic, delivered by computer in a stream of living sound, designed to be oral wallpaper. Most people think you either have silence or music. Well, generative sound comes in between those two. And I really think it's a big part of the future of soundscapes in many commercial spaces. I think the issue is that for many, many years, people have been in the habit of suppressing their response to sound. Sound, because there's so much noise around us, we've become used to just suppressing it. And most people are pretty unconscious when it comes to sound. I think a big part of this is transforming that just by asking people to pay attention. And certainly my experience when I go around the world talking in various places is that this is transformative. Once you realize that you're being unconscious about sound and you start listening, you have a chance to take responsibility for the sound around you and for the sound that you make. And if we all start doing that, we have a different world, a world that could actually sound beautiful and where we can be more productive, more healthy, better educated. You know, the payoffs are huge. So to me, this is a, it's a vast undiscovered country. It's a door we can go through that we didn't even know existed. That's what it is really exciting about this conversation. Well, if we get those things right in education, the benefits are absolutely huge. I mean, there are many classrooms where half the children can't hear half of what's being sent to them if they're, say, behind about row four in a classroom. If the classroom acoustics are poor, like reverberation times of a second or more, then it's really hard for the children at the back to hear. Now, if we're focusing on uh, delivering value for money in education, and you know, budgets are being squeezed and cut, my goodness, you know, the benefit we can get out of restoring that half of lost education to so many millions of children are absolutely enormous. And it costs very little, you know, to treat a classroom, to improve the acoustics, to remove the noise sources. It's a few thousand dollars. You amortize that over the life of the classroom. It's hundreds of dollars a year in order to deliver, you know, like double the education to many, many children. Hospitals, the same thing applies. You know, we can start to treat hospitals a lot of this is just about behavior and training, actually, because a lot of the noise in hospitals is things like people opening four ring binders at four in the morning at the end of a bed, and suddenly the patient jumps and, and is startled out of sleep. So some of it's behavior, some of it's acoustics, some of it's the threat sounds all around us all the time in hospital. Do they all have to be there, these buzzes, beeps, hisses, all of these kind of strange noises? Uh, I think there's a great deal we can do there. And Again, the outcomes will be radically improved, and that is worth huge amounts of money. To have people getting well faster, moving through the system faster, costing less in aftercare. And finally, of course, in offices where productivity can be down to 
just a third in a noisy office compared to being in a quiet office. Well, if we can restore some of that lost productivity, then it will make a big difference to competitiveness for an organization, for a nation as a whole. It's a thrill to be in a building like this, I have to say. Uh, I mean, looking at the technology here, I often say, I'm a great fan of Sherry Turkle's TED Talk, which is called Alone Together, uh, which highlights the dangers of technology, the ways in which technology can leave us with a wide number of shallow relationships, which are not really very profound at all, and hardly talking to each other, all doing this. But when you see this, this is great use of technology. This is social, it's community, there's people here sharing space, learning, and the environment is really brilliantly designed, carefully designed to be conducive to the purpose of the space. So it's a joy to see that, I'm, I'm thrilled. There are four very powerful ways in which sound affects you every day, all day. And I'm going to share those four ways with you. This is a little bit transformative. Once you're conscious of the way that sound affects you, you will be listening consciously to the world around you. So I apologize in advance for changing you, but I do believe it's a change for the better because it's a step towards increased consciousness of our environment. And once you can become conscious of something, you can change it for the better. So the four ways in which sound affects us. Sorry about that. That's a little shot of cortisol, your fight-flight hormone. Sound is causing hormone releases a lot of the time, especially sudden noises like that. I hope your alarm clock at home doesn't sound anything like that. It's not good for you if it does. Sudden noises cause this release of cortisol, noradrenaline, your fight-flight hormones. That's happening a lot. Sound also affects all of our other bodily rhythms. So if I put this sound on, for example, and leave it for a few minutes, I would counteract the effect I just gave of increasing your heart rate. This will reduce your heart rate. About 12 cycles per minute, surf. Very similar to the breathing of a sleeping human being. A sound we all find associated with being relaxed, not a care in the world, on holiday. And it will reduce your heart rate and your breathing. So heart rate, breathing, hormones, even brain waves, all entrained by sound around us. Second way sound affects us, psychologically. This piece of music is not going to make you feel happy. It wasn't designed to make you feel happy. We all know that music is a very, very good conveyor of emotion. There's not a human society on the planet that doesn't have music. We can use it to enhance a mood or to counteract a mood. It's not the only sound that changes our emotions, though. We use birdsong a great deal in the sound agency, often in offices, because over hundreds of thousands of years, we've learned that when the birds are singing, we're safe. So most people find birdsong unconsciously at a deep level very reassuring. If the birds suddenly stop singing like that, though, you need to be worried. It normally means something bad is about to happen. Birdsong is also nature's alarm clock, so it puts us in a pretty good state of cognitively alert, physically relaxed, and emotionally calm. Third way sound affects us is cognitively. So you can't understand two people talking at the same time, or in this case, one person talking twice. Not possible. Even a woman cannot understand two people talking at the same time. I'm sorry, but it's true. We have bandwidth for roughly 1.6 human conversations. So if you have to work in an office that sounds like this, it can be very destructive to your productivity, especially if you're listening to one person's conversation across the desk because they're taking up one of your 1.6, and you're left with just 0.6 to listen to the voice in your head that's trying to write that report or do that manipulation of numbers. Very, very destructive to productivity. In fact, this is the degree to which your productivity can be disrupted. There's a lot of numbers on this that have come out of research in the last few years. Now, I'm not gonna put the smallest one up on the screen. This is the biggest one I've found. It varies from 5 to 66% drop in productivity. And I'm not saying all open plan offices are bad. Like here, you have a lot of open plan spaces, but because they're properly planned, they work. You also have lots of collaborative working rooms, lots of different spaces where people are going to do different things. That is the future of office space. One size does not fit all. The problem with open plan is when it's all open plan 
because then there's nowhere to do quiet working and think. And we need that space too, as well as social working space and lots of other flavors. It's one reason why I've been very excited seeing this. The fourth and final way in which sound affects us is behaviorally. Of course it does, with all those other things going on. So ask yourself, is this person going to drive at a steady 28 miles per hour? I don't think so somehow. Sound changes our behavior fundamentally all the time. For example, we move away from unpleasant sound if we can. If I were to put this on and leave it for the next 20 minutes or so, I very much doubt that many of you would be sitting here. For people who can't get away from noise like this, the effect can be devastating, and I'm going to touch on that in a moment. We work a lot with retailers, and the number that gets them going is this one. Now, a lot of the sound that we go into when we go into shops is not great, ladies and gentlemen. It's poorly designed, it's accidental, it's just a byproduct of what's going on. Nobody's designed it properly, and actually its effect is to make us leave the shop faster, and they're losing a huge amount of money because of that. And I am talking here about mindless music and noise in retail spaces. Let me give you an example of how powerful this effect can be in a retail space. This is a piece of research that was done a few years ago in the UK by some academics. Uh, what they did was they had two identical gondola ends in a supermarket. One was selling German wine and one was selling French wine. There was nothing between them at all visually. They looked absolutely identical and all they did was to alternate French music and German music. So day one, you had a little bit of... And then day two... Now, what happened? On the French music days, French wine outsold German wine by five bottles to one. That may not be surprising. It does tend to sell more, at least in Europe. However, on the German music days, German wine outsold French wine by two bottles to one. Now that is interesting. And if you'd said to the people leaving the shop, did you buy that bottle of Liebfrau milk because of the German music playing? Do you know what they would have said? What music? It's non-conscious, we're suppressing sound all the time, and yet this is the kind of effect it's having on behavior. If that's what design sound can do, just think of what the accidental, unpleasant sound is doing to customers and to all of us in our daily lives. So really, this is a plea to all of you, to all of everybody who's involved in designing spaces to design the sound for best effect. I want to just touch on something else which is germane here, cross-modal effects. You may not have come across these. This is the way in which the senses interrelate. I'm not talking about sound in isolation because sound interrelates with the other senses. And I'll give you an example of this. Uh, this lovely chap here is going to prove it to you. This is called the McGurk effect. Has anybody come across that before? should work on about 85, 90% of you. I'd like you to look at the screen and listen to what the guy is saying. Now, most of you will be hearing da da. Now close your eyes. He's actually saying ba ba. And on the film, he's saying gaga. So your eyes see gaga, your ears hear ba ba, and your brain says, that's da da. You can't override this, even though you now know he's saying ba ba. If you look at the screen, you will hear da da. So I'm just proving to you there that what you hear is not necessarily real. That's interesting, isn't it? Reality is a synthesis, it's an approximation to what's going on out there, but it's not real and every one of our realities of course is completely different because we all have different listening filters different stuff going on so that the senses interrelate and affect one another if you line them up you get a thing called super additivity i'm sorry if you line them up you get a thing called super additivity now one plus one in the world of super additivity is not two if you add congruent sound to a visual stimulus one plus one according to the neurology, neurological research, is around 12. On the other hand, if your sound is incongruent, pointing in the opposite direction to your visual stimulus, you go down to about 14% of what you started with in terms of impact. Now ask yourself, do you want to hang out in your local supermarket? Probably not. Does it look awful? 
No. Does it smell awful? Not usually. They're pumping freshly baked bread smells back into these places now. It sounds dreadful. Beeps, buzzes, hums, clashes, screaming kids. You don't want to hang out in a place that sounds like that. That is the opposite of super additivity. The sound is undermining all the money they're spending on that marketing, on the visuals, and on the smell. It's a powerful effect. Now let's just talk about noise for a moment. Graham mentioned noise earlier, and I'm going to mention it now. Four main sources. Traffic noise I've already talked about. Air noise, of course, is another one. Uh, you've got industrial noise as well, uh, and construction. It can be very, very damaging. The numbers are terrifying, uh, mainly coming out of Europe at the moment. I'm not aware of so many coming out of the UK. But let me just share with you three big numbers. That's a big number. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the number of people in Europe whose quality of life is being seriously disturbed by noise, largely traffic noise at night, according to the European Union. 25% of Europe's population. That's a huge number of people. This is the number of years, according to the World Health Organization, of healthy life that's being lost every year in Europe because of traffic noise alone. And the cost is astronomical. Tens of billions of euros, quite possibly even more than that. We're only beginning to scratch the surface of looking at this, but the WHO is absolutely clear that noise pollution is coming up fast. It's almost as serious as air pollution, if not there already, as a social bad. It's having a huge effect on our health, largely through the mechanism of sleep deprivation, because of noise at night. So you get people who are irritable, you get people who are not well, who are stressed, who suffer from depression, and so on, and so on, and so on. It's a big problem. And it's a problem not just out there in the world. It's a problem in some of our most important spaces. Take this one, for example. How does anybody get well in a place that sounds like this? I can't understand how it works. And it's doubling. Noise in hospitals is going up, not down. We're getting worse, not better. It has effects on all sorts of things. I mean, I think we'd like prescribing errors to be zero, wouldn't we? But if you put people working in a noisy space like this, they make mistakes. And those mistakes can be deadly. And of course, the biggest effect is on sleep. If you have somebody who's trying to get well, sleep is the most important part of the day. And yet we put them in a soundscape that's full of threat noises. That's going to disturb your rapid eye movement sleep deeply. Not to mention people un undoing four ring binders at the end of your bed at four in the morning, which suddenly wakes you out of deep sleep. A lot of issues there to deal with. The other major environment I'd like just to bring to your attention is not dissimilar to the one we're in, it's education. If this is the peak of the education mountain, there are many, many places that don't even get into the foothills. When I see a classroom that looks like this, I'm forced to ask a question. Now, to the architects in the audience, I'm sorry I'm not being rude, but I have come into classrooms that look like this, and clearly nobody has thought, how is this going to sound? With 40 kids doing group work in teams of five all the way through, Studies are showing the damaging effect of this kind of stuff all over the place. Here's one. Uh, that was, I, actually, there's one from Florida, which showed that from about where we're sitting here, row four back, speech intelligibility was just 50%. The kids could only hear one word in two. Now, it doesn't mean they don't get half their education because they can interpolate, but it does mean they have to do a lot of extra work to understand what's going on. That's not handy. This is the kind of sound you get in many classrooms that sound like that. It's a reverberation time of around 1.2 seconds. That's not atypical for old-fashioned classrooms particularly. If you cut that down to 0.4 seconds, you suddenly have an intelligible signal. But there are millions of kids sitting at the back of classrooms that sound like that first one who are struggling to hear anything at all. If you liken education to watering a garden, and I think we probably can, 
a huge amount of that water is going to waste. And particularly for some groups which have real issues hearing in the first place. There are plenty of kids with hearing impairment. I'm not talking about necessarily just the permanently hearing impaired, which is probably only 2% of the school population. But on any given day, there's a whole bunch of kids who've got colds, glue ear, flu, or some sort of an ear, a hearing in, uh, an ear infection. So they suddenly become temporarily hearing impaired. That's a very large proportion of the school population. You've also got people for whom English is a second language or whatever language they're being taught in. You have introverts. I do commend to you Susan Cain's wonderful TED talk about the power of introverts. We're forcing them to work in group work. They don't like it. They have to struggle to hear in those situations. And then it was pointed out to me recently uh, in Copenhagen when I was doing a talk like this, ADHD and conditions like that are also uh, real sufferers from not being able to hear. It takes great concentration. This is the kind of effect it has. 65 decibels is pretty loud. I mean, I would have to be shouting over the top of it pretty much like this. That's the average noise level in German classrooms in this study. Now, if you look at the dots on this graph, the red dots, uh, the black dots are the noise level. The red dots are the teacher's heart rate. The red dots are the teacher's heart rate. In other words, when the noise goes up, the heart rate goes up. Now, that's not healthy. 65 decibels is the level at which noise-induced risk of myocardial infarction kicks in. That's heart attack. It's quite possible that many, many teachers are shortening their lives by working in environments like this where they have to shout over the top of children continually, especially with group work now. Once upon a time, we sat quietly in rows. Now there's continual group work going on. It's not healthy. The cost of treating a classroom in a recent study in the UK in order to neutralize this effect, two and a half thousand pounds. So what, $4,000 maybe? Amortize that over 10 years. It's peanuts. The cost of sending a child out of area, a hearing impaired child out of area, if you don't have a suitable classroom in the UK, 90,000 pounds a year. This is very simple math, I think. We need to do something about this and quickly. Uh, we have uh, been working on this at the Sound Agency in conjunction with uh, a Swedish acoustics company who paid for us to produce a nice little app. It might be something you'd want to suggest to your kids, maybe. Uh, it's called Study, and it's available on the App Store. And it sounds a bit like this. It's designed just to be masking sound. If you have to work in a busy kitchen or something like that, put some headphones on and there is 45 minutes of that which will mask the sound and help people to work. We have a model at the sound agency of sound design which goes like this. You start with the drivers when we're auditing spaces, this is. We start with the drivers up at the top, the basic building blocks of sound, and we then go through the environment. And I'll come on to the, uh, the environment a little bit more in a moment, but just asking, for example, what are people trying to do in this space? And these are basic questions that we need to answer. This is a library. But it's not an old-fashioned library where the rule is, shh. This is a new library where it's collaboration. There's conversation going on. There's multimedia to enjoy. So we need to understand exactly what people are trying to do. And everybody who's been involved in designing this place asked that question very well. It's getting a harder question to us, too. What on earth do we know about 10 years' time? What on earth are people going to be doing in this building in 10 years' time? Hard to guess, isn't it? particularly with the kind of social change that Mark was alluding to earlier with technology driving. So, what are people trying to do? Who are the people in the space? What do they like? What don't they like? And what is the brand, if it's a branded space, or the values behind the space? What kind of sound should it be making? And then we have the environment. Graham mentioned earlier the four aspects of good sound, acoustics, noise, sound system, content. So thinking about all of those things, we can then start to say, well, these are, if you make that noise in this space, these are the effects you're going to have on people. Going the other way, though, much more exciting for you. If you want to have these effects on people in that space, this is the kind of sound you need to design. This is conscious designing with sound. Not just sound being the byproduct of what's going on in the space, but actually designing soundscapes. 
Invisible architecture, if you will. Now we have urban planners in the world. Where are the urban sound planners? I do not know of one. I've given this talk all over the world and I've been pleading for somebody to get in touch with me. I haven't had one experience of an urban sound planner. I don't think there is one. We have office planners. It's rare that you get a building that's designed as well as this. Where are the office sound planners? How come in advertising agencies they so often put the creatives next to the suits and their war breaks out because the creative guys like the radio on and pumping music because they're in flow and the suits over there are trying to write a report and can't think. Somebody thought it's good because they need to communicate with each other. That kind of office planning doesn't work. So, office sound planning. And then, of course, at home, we have interior designers. Well, let's all get into interior sound design. Let's have rooms with soundscapes in them that support us in our activities that change through the day. It's not just music or silence. There's many other things we can do. So just to remind you, this is what Graham covered earlier on. These are the four building blocks. These are the steps that are necessary. You have to go through each in turn. If you don't have good acoustics as a base, then pretty much all is lost. If you have a lot of noise in a room, and you know, we do think rooms are silent when they're not. For example, now this is the kind of thing I'm afraid you will be conscious of from now on, because you will be listening, and you may thank me and you may not, as you go into a Starbucks and say, what is that chiller cabinet doing? But it's good, because at least if you're conscious, you can move yourself away from unhealthy sound and you can take responsibility for the sound you are making. So noise sources. Then we have sound system, smart, zoned, high quality. Then and only then can we get into content. And I just want to finish with some examples of content. First, a, a word on how we do content. A good place to start is here. Silence. The Elizabethans described conversation as decorated Silence. Now, I think that's a wonderful way to think about designing sound for spaces. If we can't decorate the silence, silence is fine. People will make the noise. Now, obviously, there are trade-offs in spaces. You may have to have privacy, for example, in which case you need some background masking sound. Please don't put white noise and pink noise in. It's nasty. Perfume on a stink is just more smell. It's not pleasant. There are plenty of masking sounds that we can deploy which are actually pleasant. Bird song's good, water's good, natural stochastic sounds that we're used to hearing. They can be very pleasant, but actually in a space like this one out here, it's been so well designed that just the general babble of people talking produces enough privacy for you and me to have a private conversation 10 feet away from each other and people over there aren't hearing us. That's smart design. So silence is the starting point, and from silence, it's a bit like a work of art. We think about foreground sound, sound features that we might want to emphasize. You can have sound art. There's plenty of sound art out there now. And then background stuff, which we don't necessarily want people to pay much attention to, but which is designed to be supportive. We have a technology now which does allow us to do something in between silence and music. It's called generative sound. This is an example we just deployed in Harrods in London. It's a soundscape called Glass, and it's playing in the department that sells fine glass, crystal, Wedgwood, and so forth. Every one of the sounds in this soundscape is made by glass, and then adjusted with digital signal processing to create more musical sounds. I mean, glass can be very musical anyway. Run your finger around a glass, flick a glass, and so forth. So that kind of sound is not designed to be listened to. It's oral wallpaper. It's designed to be in the background and just produce a lovely ambience. Let me give you an example from this bank in Colombia that we worked with. It's a pretty good example of a multi-sensory environment. Uh, this is a few years ago. The bank is called Helm. It used to look like this, Banco de Credito, an old-fashioned upmarket bank, and they've changed their brand to this, which is pretty radical, isn't it? So now it looks like this, and it's a very different bank because those are the brand values. Do you see loyal, secure, trustworthy, or any of those? So it's a radical rethink of a banking brand. 
and they wanted it to be a multi-sensory rethink. So when you go inside the branches, you get an interior which emphasizes all the aspects of the brand, the colors, the sensations, the textures. They're all there. It's been implemented in taste as well uh, and in smell. So in smell, there's a fragrance that's refragranced every time the branch is cleaned. It's in the cleaning product. And there's sound. So we created three soundscapes for this project. The first is a very, very laid back soundscape. It plays very quietly in the background. And it's designed for this high class area where their top customers sit and wait for meetings or just sit and work or do anything. It's designed to be, it's pretty spa-like actually because it's got the similar uh, intentions to spa, to relax. Now you're becoming sound experts, very slow tempo and train everything down, a little bit of bird song, security, mental alertness, and so on. You see how it works. There's another soundscape for the non-customers. This is an area outside the branch where people are just paying gas bills or whatever. They're not even customers of the bank. This soundscape has a, a tempo of 100 beats per minute. That's just faster than the human heart rate. You can hear the pulse as, as this goes on. You'll hear little pulsed bits. It's a gentle hand in the back saying, thanks very much, but just would you like to move on and leave now? Anything faster than your heart rate, around 80 beats per minute, tends to speed you up a little bit. So you can hear that. And then there was a third soundscape which came from this tree up here. We had hypersonic loudspeakers, beams of sound bouncing off those leaves with the sound of the tropical rainforest, which is the sound of Colombia's natural habitat. So it sounded like that was coming from the leaves. Overall, the results of this whole exercise were stunning. Their customer satisfaction went up from 64% to 90%, and in the treated branches, new account signups doubled. So they were pretty chuffed with the whole exercise. And we made them a little Sonic logo, which you heard at the beginning. It's a whistle, which is also pretty chirpy for a bank. It's very human, and many, many of their staff has that, have that as their personal ringtone on their mobile phones now. One final example I want to share with you is Harrods. It's a, a store which some of you may have heard of. And instead of having kiddie music in the brand new Toy Kingdom in Harrods, what we've deployed is more of a Disney-like experience. This is the uh, big top area, and of course we've got circus sound in there. So there's all sorts of sound coming out of lots of different loudspeakers. It's generative, it doesn't repeat itself. It's, a, it's a, an organic flowing source of sound. You move into the Enchanted Forest, which is full of little girls' toys, and in some of these flower pots, you have a little fairy voice that comes out like that. And only audible to people who are about three feet tall, generally. So it doesn't bother the adults. And overhead, you've got rustling branches and magical sounds of things flying past in the air. You move through this area into the main chunk of the store here, which is called Wonderland. And here we've created, again, a generative soundscape. So this isn't recorded. It's played live by a computer. Sounds a bit like the John Williams soundtrack to E.T. or something like that. It's just designed to create a, a feeling of wonder and uh, mystery and uh, engagement. There are a couple of islands in this space. One has cars with scale electric set and the other one has train sets. So, of course, out of the islands, we have those sounds coming to make it live and be even more exciting. And then as you move past this area, you come to this huge thing which bursts through a wall and we have this great bassy sound which is delivered through subwoofers and surface transducers and that takes you into the science fiction toys area where we've created a soundscape for this room that's called odyssey sounds a bit like being on the bridge of the starship enterprise or something like that so you get all these bloops and beeps and every so often the whole thing goes into hyperdrive as i think it will in a moment No, it didn't. And then the final room is the reading room, and there's a mural right around this wall with seams from typical, archetypical children's books, pirates, cowboys, you know, so on. And we have soundscapes for each of those in turn, which rotate. That's a long way from mindless pop music in a retail space. It's an experience. That's what I'm talking about. 
That's very foreground generative sound. Most of it's background, but it really works. Let me leave you with the four golden rules uh, for sound in any sort of space, commercial space, even your home. First of all, let's make the sound congruent with whatever brand or values are to be expressed in the space, whatever activity is going to be taking place in there, so we can gain super additivity. So we're working with all the senses in harmony, aligned. Not just the eyes, but the eyes and the ears, the nose, and also, of course, touch and taste if it's relevant. Second, let's make it appropriate. Very often we're assailed with sound that's just totally inappropriate for the situation we're in. We don't have to do that. We don't have to suffer that. We can complain. If you're, next time you're in a restaurant bellowing from one foot away to your dinner partner, just complain to the people who are running it and explain that you're leaving and you won't be back because of the noise. If we don't give feedback, nothing changes. So appropriate. Third, let's make it valuable. If we can't add value with sound, let's not make any sound at all. Really. Sometimes a bit of noise is necessary. These fans are necessary, otherwise the projectors blow up. One day that won't be so, but for the time being, we suffer these things. But if we can, if we are consciously making any sound, it should be a valuable sound. And finally, it's test, 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 and test, because some of these influences countervail. You know, you can speed people up with noise, and they might, with music, for example, and they might leave faster, but if they really enjoy the music, they might stay longer, like Abercrombie and Fitch does for my 14-year-old daughter. I have a deal with them. They don't want me in there. I don't want me in there either. My credit card goes in at the end, with me reluctantly following it for as little time as possible. That's music as a filter. It's fine. I understand that. They've tested that, probably. So let's test and test. What I'm talking about, ladies and gentlemen, is designing a different way. It's not designing appearance. It's designing experience. Let's really think about invisible architecture. Let's think about designing for all of the senses so we create and curate amazing, wonderful experiences. If we can move to a world where we're listening consciously, a world where we're making sound consciously, then we have a chance of having a world that sounds beautiful. And that's the vision I'd love to enroll you in. Thank you very much for lending me your ears today, ladies and gentlemen.